The ideal of a universal religion. How it must embrace different types of minds and methods. Religion is the highest plane of human thought, and herein we find that the actions of these two forces have been most marked. The intensest love that humanity has ever known has come from religion, and the most diabolical hatred that humanity has known has come from religion. The noblest words of peace the world has ever heard have come from men on this plane, and the bitterest denunciation that the world has ever known has sprung from religious men. The higher the object, the finer the organization, the more remarkable are its actions. So we find that in religion these two forces are very remarkable in their actions. No other human interest has deluged the world so much in blood as religion. At the same time, nothing has built so many hospitals and asylums for the poor. No other human influence has taken such care, not only of humanity, but of the lowest animals, as religion. Nothing makes us so cruel as religion. Nothing makes us so tender as religion. This has been in the past and will be in the future. Yet from the midst of this din and turmoil and strife and struggling, the hatred and jealousy of religions and sects, from time to time arise potent voices, crying above all this noise, making themselves heard from pole to pole, as it were, for peace, for harmony. Will it ever come? Our subject for discussion is, is it possible that there ever should come harmony in this tremendous plane of struggle? The world is agitated in the latter part of the century by questions of harmony. In society, various plans are being proposed. Various attempts are made to carry them into practice, but we know how difficult that is. People find it almost impossible to mitigate the fury of the struggle of life, to tone down the tremendous nervous tension that is in man. Now, if it is so difficult to bring harmony and peace and love in this little bit of our life, which deals with the physical plane of man, the external, gross, outward side, a thousand times more difficult is it to bring peace and harmony in that internal nature of man. I would ask you for the time being to come out of the network of words. We are hearing from childhood such words as love and peace and brotherhood and equality and universal brotherhood. But they have become words without meaning, which we repeat like parrots, and it is natural for us to do so. We cannot help it. Great, gigantic souls who felt in their hearts these great ideas first manufactured these words, and at that time many understood their meaning. Later, ignorant people take the words and play upon them, and religion becomes a play in their hands, mere frothy words, not to be carried into practice. It becomes my father's religion, our nation's religion, your country's religion, and so forth. It becomes only a phase of patriotism. To bring harmony in religion, therefore, must be most difficult. Yet we will try to study this phenomenon. We see that in every religion there are three parts, I mean in every great and recognized religion. First, there is the philosophy, the doctrines, the ideals of that religion, which embodies the goal, embodies as it were the whole scope of that religion, lays before its votaries and followers the principle of that religion, the way to reach the goal. Next, that philosophy is embodied in mythology. So the second part is mythology. This mythology comes in the form of lives of men or of supernatural beings and so forth. It is the same thing as philosophy made a little more concrete. The abstractions of philosophy become concretized in the lives of men and supernatural beings. The last portion is the ritual. This is still more concrete, forms and ceremonies, various physical attitudes, flowers and incense, and everything that appeals to the senses. In this consists the ritual. You will find that everywhere, recognized religions have all these three. Some lay more stress on one side, some on the other. We will take the first part, philosophy. Is there any universal philosophy for the world? Not yet. Each religion brings out its own doctrines and insists upon them as being the only real ones. And not only does it do that, but it thinks that the man who does not believe them must go to some horrible place. Some of them will not stop there. They will draw the sword to compel others to believe as they do. This is not through wickedness, but through a particular disease of the human brain called fanaticism. They are very sincere, these fanatics, the most sincere of human beings, but they are not more responsible than any other lunatics in the world. This disease of fanaticism is one of the most dangerous of all diseases. All the wickedness of human nature is aroused by it. Anger is stirred up, nerves are strung high, and human beings become like tigers. Is there any similarity, is there any harmony, any universal mythology? Certainly not. Each religion has its own mythology, with only this difference, that each one says, my stories are not mythologies. 
For instance, take the question home. I simply mean to illustrate it. I do not mean any criticism of any religion. The Christian believes that God took the shape of a dove and came down, and they think this is history and not mythology. But the Hindu believes that God is manifested in the cow. Christians say that is mythology and not history, superstition. The Jews think that if an image be made in the form of a box or a chest with an angel on either side, then it is to be placed in the Holy of Holies. It is sacred to Jehovah. But if the image be made in the form of a beautiful man or woman, they say, this horrible idol, break it down. This is our unity in mythology. If a man stands up and says, my prophet did such and such a wonderful thing, others say that is superstition. But their prophet did a still more wonderful thing. They say that this is historical. Nobody in the world, as far as I have seen, is able to find out the fine distinction between history and mythology in the brains of these gentlemen. All these stories are mythological, mixed up with a little history. Next come the rituals. One sect has one particular form of ritual and thinks that is the holy form, and that the rituals of another sect are simply errant superstition. If one sect worships a peculiar sort of symbol, another sect says, oh, it's horrible. Take, for instance, the most general form of symbol. The phallus symbol is certainly a sexual symbol, but gradually that part of it was forgotten, and it stands as a symbol of the Creator. Those nations which have this as their symbol never think of it as the phallus. It is just a symbol, and there it ends. But a man from another race sees in it nothing but the phallus and begins to condemn it, yet at the same time may be doing something that to the phallic worshipper appears most horrible. I will take two points, the phallus symbol and the sacrament of the Christians. To the Christians, the phallus is horrible, and to the Hindus, the Christian sacrament is horrible. They say that the Christian sacrament, the killing of a man and eating his flesh and blood to get the good qualities of that man, is cannibalism. This is what some of the savage tribes do. If a man is brave, they kill him and eat his heart, because they think it will give them the qualities of bravery possessed by that man. Even such a devout Christian as Sir John Lubbock admits this, and says the origin of this symbol is in this savage idea. The Christians generally do not admit this idea of its origin, and what it may imply never comes to their minds. It stands for a holy thing, and that is all they want to know. So even in rituals there is no universal symbol which can lead to a general recognition. Where then is this universality? How is it possible then to have a universal form of religion? That already exists. We all hear about the universal brotherhood and how societies stand up and want to preach this. But to what does it amount? Universal brotherhood. We are all equal, therefore make a sect. As soon as you make a sect, you protest against equality, and thus it is no more. Mohammedans say universal brotherhood, but what comes in reality? Nobody who is not a Mohammedan will be admitted. He will have his throat cut. The Christians say universal brotherhood, but anyone who is not a Christian must go to that place and be eternally barbecued. So we are being carried on in this world after universal brotherhood and equality, universal equality of property and thought and everything. And I would simply ask you to look askance and be a little reticent and take a little care of yourselves when you hear such talk in this world. Behind it, many times, comes intensest selfishness. In the winter, sometimes a cloud comes. It roars and roars, but it does not rain. But in the rainy season, the clouds speak not, but deluge the world with water. So those who are really workers and really feel the universal brotherhood of man do not talk much, do not make little sects for universal brotherhood. But their acts, their whole body, their posture, their movements, their walk, eating, drinking, their whole life, show that brotherhood for mankind that love and sympathy for all. They do not speak, they do. This world is getting full of blustering talk. We want a little more work and less talk. So far, we see that it is hard to find any universal ideas in this, and yet we know they exist. We are all human beings, but are we all equal? Certainly not. Who says we are equal? Only the man who is a lunatic, he alone can say we are all equal. Are we all equal in our brains, in our powers, in our bodies? One man is stronger than another, one man has more brain power than another. If we are all equal, why is this inequality? Who made it? We. Because we have more or less powers, more brain, more physical strength, it must make a difference. Yet we know that the doctrine appeals to us. Take another case. We are all human beings here, but there are some men and some women. Here is a black man, there is a white man, but all are men, all humanity. Various faces, I see no two faces here the same, yet we are all human beings. 
Where is this humanity? I cannot find it. When I try to analyze it, I do not find where it is. Either I find a man or a woman, either dark or fair, and among all these faces, that abstract humanity which is the common thing, I do not find when I try to grasp, to sense, and actualize it, and think of it. It is beyond the senses, it is beyond thought, beyond the mind, yet I know and am certain it is there. If I am certain of anything here, it is this humanity which is a common quality among all. And yet I cannot find it. This humanity is what you call God. In him we live and move and have our being. In him and through him we have our being. It is through this I see you as a man or a woman, yet when I want to catch or formulate it, it is nowhere because it is beyond the senses, and yet we know that in it and through it everything exists. So with this universal oneness and sympathy, this universal religion which runs through all these various religions as God, it must and does exist through eternity. I am the thread that runs through all these pearls, and each pearl is one of these sects. They are all the different pearls, but the Lord is the thread that runs through all of them. Only the majority of mankind are entirely unconscious of it, yet they are working in it and through it. Not a moment can they stand outside it, because all work is only possible through and in it, yet we cannot formulate it. It is God himself. Unity and variety is the plan of the universe. Just as we are all men, yet we are all separate. As humanity, I am one with you, and as Mr. So-and-so, I am different from you. As a man, you are separate from the woman. As a human being, you are one with the woman. As a man, you are separate from the animal. But as a living being, the man, the woman, the animal, the plant, all are one. And as existence, you are one with the whole universe. That existence is God, the ultimate unity in this universe. In him, we are all one. At the same time, in manifestation, these differences must always remain. In our work, in our energies that are being manifested outside, these differences must remain always. We find then that if the idea of a universal religion is meant one set of doctrines should be believed by all mankind, it is impossible. It can never be, any more than there will be a time when all faces will be the same. Again, if we expect that there will be one universal mythology, that is also impossible. It cannot be. Neither can there be one universal ritual. This cannot be. When that time will come, this world will be destroyed, because variety is the first principle of life. What makes us formed beings? Differentiation. Perfect balance will be destruction. Suppose the amount of heat in this room, whose tendency is perfect diffusion, gets that diffusion, that heat will cease to be. What makes motion in this universe? Lost balance, that is all. That sort of unity can only come when the universe will be destroyed, but in the world such a thing is impossible. Not only so, it is dangerous. We must not seek that all of us should think alike. There would be no thought to think. We would be all alike, like Egyptian mummies in a museum, looking at each other without thought to think. It is this difference of thought, this differentiation, losing of the balance of thought, which is the very soul of our progress, the soul of thought. This must always be. What then do I mean by the ideal of a universal religion? I do not mean a universal philosophy, or a universal mythology, or a universal ritual, but I mean that this world must go on wheel within wheel, this intricate mass of machinery, most intricate, most wonderful. What can we do? We can make it run smoothly, we can lessen the friction, we can grease the wheels, as it were. By what? By recognizing variation. Just as we have recognized unity, by our very nature, so we must also recognize variation. We must learn that truth may be expressed in a hundred thousand ways, and each one yet be true. We must learn that the same thing can be viewed from a hundred different standpoints, and yet be the same thing. Take, for instance, the sun. Suppose a man standing on the earth looks at the sun when it rises in the morning. He sees a big ball. Suppose he starts toward the sun and takes a camera with him, taking photographs at every stage of his journey. At every thousand miles he takes a fresh photograph until he reaches the sun. At each stage, each photograph was different from the other photographs. In fact, when he gets back, he brings with him so many thousands of photographs of so many different suns, as it were, and yet we know it was the same sun photographed by the man at every stage of his progress. Even so with the Lord. Greater or lesser, through high philosophy or low, through the highest or lowest doctrines, through the most refined mythology or the grossest, through the most refined ritualism or the grossest, every sect, every soul, every nation, every religion, consciously or unconsciously, is struggling upward, Godward, and each vision is that of him and of none else. 
Suppose we each one of us go with a particular pot in our hand to fetch water from a lake. Suppose one has a cup, another a jar, another a bigger jar, and so forth, and we all fill them. When we take them up, the water in each case is got into the form of the vessel. He who brought the cup has water in the form of a cup. He who brought the jar, his water is in the shape of a jar, and so forth. But in every case, water, and nothing but water, is in the vessel. So, in the case of religion, our minds are like these little pots, and each one of us is seeing God. God is like that water filling these different vessels, and in each vessel the vision of God comes in the form of the vessel. Yet he is one. He is God in every case. This is the recognition that we can get. So far, it is all right theoretically, but is there any way of practically working it out?